Okay, so I might have mentioned before that one time I was watching a, a television. On the rare occasion I watch TV. I do watch TV sometimes, by the way. Um, I watch TV and the chef, Jamie Oliver, was teaching these people to cook uh, in a deprived town somewhere. Um, so he's teaching them to cook healthily. If what you class, he cooks is healthy. I don't know. Everyone's got their own opinion. But anyway, um, he was teaching them to cook. And I found it quite fascinating because on his journey, he's teaching these sort of families to cook. Um, they're actually doing what he's teaching them. They're doing, they're, they're, they're preparing meals for their family, healthy meals, at least what he classes as healthy, and, and they're cooking for themselves, and things are going really, really well while he's in that town. Okay, there's, there's banter, there's fun, there's, but they're cooking these healthy meals. Okay, now, what I find quite interesting is that um, when he went back a few months later, they showed the program, and he asked them, he goes, uh, are you still cooking well? I interviewed families. And there was like a, we talk about acuity, it was like a barrier. And one woman said to Jamie Oliver, she goes, no, we're not. We're not cooking well, what you class as well anyway. And he goes, why? And, and I repeat loosely the program. And she goes, well, it's all right for you. It's all right for you, Jamie. You're well off. You've got loads of money. We can't afford it. And I thought, sitting there watching TV, I, I, I don't know James at all, so I don't know what his wealth is, and I don't know any of that. So I've never met him, I don't know him, and I don't know how much, how well she knows him to make that comment. But equally, she goes, it's right for you, Jamie, um, to do that, but we, we, we can't do that. And I thought, okay, maybe she has got a point. And she goes, what I do, I, I just give my uh, kids um, 20 pounds to buy a chip every day. I thought, wow, that's quite fascinating. And Jamie kind of backed off from, from what I saw in the TV program and, and, and it sort of fizzled out. But here's me thinking to myself, wow, I probably wouldn't have been as diplomatic as Jamie Oliver because I think 20 pounds does buy a, a fair bit of groceries, um, enough to cook what he was suggesting they do cook. And whether you buy into what he cooks as being healthy or not, I'm sure what you guys are being healthy. So we want to hold that thought uh, for the moment and, and, and think about that. You know, why did they not carry on cooking? Did they not value it? Did they not believe in it? Um, did they not, uh, part of the identity of how they defined who they were? Was it the environment where they were? They didn't have the resources to do it. Was it behavioral, the motivation to do it? Was it the capability? But he taught them, and they had the resources to do it, and the, the motivation when he was there. But we, we don't do this here. It's quite an interesting remark. It's all right for you. Okay? To quote Einstein, um, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So my interpretation is, of Einstein, um, that to solve an issue, we've got to go to a level beyond the problem that we created for ourselves, or at least meet it at the level we created, and then go above and beyond. But that's another story for another day. Um, equally, what I would say, what I find quite fascinating, is think back to Woolworths. They, they were around for 100 years or so, I think, yeah, in, in, in the UK. When I mean Woolworths, I mean Woolworths in the UK, because I believe there's a Woolworths, when I teach in Australia, there's a Woolworths out there, it's a different Woolworths that sells groceries. But the Woolworths in the UK was around for 100 years. Okay? Now, I recall going to Woolworths on the last days before it sort of shut down. And what I found quite fascinating, at the time, there were other stores that were adapting and changing. Um, there were other stores that were changing their product line, there are other stores that were adapting and offering some of the things that they were offering and more things that they were offering as well. Other stores going to the clothing range, electronics, and, and, and we know that now. But equally, they didn't seem to have changed a great deal. Only other than when I walk, walk in the board sometime, 
there was like a pick and mix all over the floor and it looked like a disaster site. The actual yeah. environment looked like, you know, it looked like it'd just been a hurricane had just blown into the store and, and, and it's quite fascinating. But then equally you look at Kodak and they went um, and many, many organisations have been around for a long time and sometimes it's not revolution, it's evolution. Sometimes people fail to evolve and stay at the times. And we see organisations that do evolve, that do change, that do set new outcomes, that do overcome certain challenges. Uh, you know, certainly Kodak, I think one of the biggest issues they would, they would face would be the, uh, the, the, this generation. Because um, I believe in the last few years there's been more pictures taken on than, than any, any, any in, in one year I think there's been more, more pictures taken than in hundred years prior to the digital age. So I, I suppose that has a lot to do with it, but point being is that things change. And I don't know if you recall the old video shops that used to sort of be around and that might be before <laughs> some of your time, but you know, when I was going to these video shops you'd turn up and, and they're gone because life changes, nothing stays the same. Things are always changing, and it's how we adapt to the situation that we're in will have a big part of our evolutionary process. Um, and it's quite fascinating when you see programs like, say, the Kitchen Nightmares. No, the, I think it's Gordon Ramsay. But is it Gordon Ramsay? Yeah. His name? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's Kitchen Nightmares. And you know, the guy <laughs> he swears a lot for my reckoning, so <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't sort of uh, take too kindly, but. The irony was, if you look at the show, you kind of wonder, well, he goes to these stores, these restaurants. Not, I, I, like, I don't know him, and I don't know what he does outside of what the program is, but it's quite fascinating, the levels that he works at these restaurants. And you kind of, kind of think, okay, it, it's quite interesting what he does. And, and I believe the success rate, from what I've been told, I stand corrected, isn't very high after he's gone, after the euphoria, I, I believe it. Yeah, I mean, that might be the case, it might not be the case, and, but that's what I've been told, and... and you know, we can we can do we can do a, a research project if we if we care. Um, but it's interesting too. But also equally, like when you see the other programs, like you know the other guy, um, you know I think it was Gok who used to sort of do makeovers for people, and and and, and they'd feel good um, at that point. But sometimes the follow up, they'd sort of go back to where they were before. To one respect, you know, sometimes people they they reduce their weight, they have the cosmetic surgery, and I'm not against all them things. It's great if you, that's what you want to do. Um, they buy new clothes, they move, but then they're sort of back to baseline. There's no long-term change. And sometimes the person you see in the mirror, there's no running away from it. Sometimes you, you want to work at things on, on, on various levels. And it's quite fascinating how in certain situations, um, some people do uh, you know, better than others, uh, all things being equal. Now you might be thinking now, this guy watches too much TV. But it's fascinating because in another situation one time, is, you know, think about this for a moment. You've got one guy who's got all the capabilities, the motivation um, to do what he wants to do. This is in the world of sport. And he's, he's, he was a great footballer. He'd won, I think, Football of the Year twice. An amazing footballer, really well loved by people. Um, you know, great footballer. No doubt had all the credentials to be a football manager. And he never succeeded in football management. And you've got to wonder why. And equally, there's people with less credentials than him. And one guy, he was never a professional footballer. And it's quite fascinating that he actually was a translator. And he would go on to be a huge success as a manager. Now, the irony is, if you're a chairman of a football club, who are you going to hire? The guy who's been a top pro player, with all, you know, a lot of credentials, really well revered um, as, a, as, a, as a sports person. Or the guy who's got no professional football experience. Um, you are kind of going to lean towards the guy for the experience, one would think. Okay. Uh, now I don't know any of these two guys personally, but I have worked in sport at the highest level, and I know that belief and identity and values plays a big part of our success. And you take the first guy I mentioned. I was watching TV, um, and it was an interview we had after England had lost, I think, to Germany, the last game at Wembley in the World Cup qualifier or the European Cup qualifier. It was on TV. And he goes, I'm not cut out for this. Okay, and I like to listen to people. I'm quite observant. He goes, I'm not cut out for this. That was Kevin Keegan. I don't know Kevin Keegan. I've never met the guy. But he says at the interview on T when he was interviewed by the reporter, I'm not cut out for this. So is that a belief? Is that his identity? Does he value the work he's doing? Equally, the other guy, when he was interviewed at a press conference, he gets a job for Chelsea. 
He goes, I'm the special one. Jose Mourinho, like Mojave, he's one of the most successful managers of this generation. You know, like we got, I've never met Jose either, um, but I do admire what he's achieved. And you think, okay, you know, what is it? And, and we sort of we'll, we'll reflect on, on some of these things as we go on our journey that makes the difference. How many people are equally as competent or even better than somebody else but don't succeed because of their beliefs? Or maybe their values, what they value, uh, or maybe their identity. You know, all things being equal. There's plenty of people out there, and then people moan sometimes saying, well, I was better than him or her. Well, there would have been a difference that made the difference at some level, one would say. Um, now, I'm not judging any of the people I've spoken about because I don't know any of them, but I'm just putting it out there um, from a reference point of view to show that there are variable permutations in anyone achieving an outcome or sustaining an outcome, uh, and things change. We died on yesterday, we probably won't have nothing to eat tomorrow. So the, the world is constantly evolving uh, and going from there. So today I'm going to cover, um, we're going to move into logical levels. Logical levels was pioneered by uh, Robert Diltz back in the early days of NLP. And um, logical levels for me, um, the, the origins uh, go back to um, the work by uh, Russell, Russell's works on. on Russell's work on logical types. You can go as far back as, um, and you can Google it, you know, Russell's work on logical types. Um, and he talked about the uh, statement refers to a class that manifests a higher level of abstraction. So you can sort of Google that if you, if you choose to, and you'll see the origins um, of that. Uh, and then Bateson, you can Google Bateson, and, and he took the level a little bit further uh, to consider learning levels of learning uh, at the top of my head. As a result uh, of Bateson's work, um, Dills was able to develop the logical levels of learning and change, which we're going to go into in more detail and have done so far in the course uh, and go from there. So a logical level uh, is used for understanding change in a person, team, or company. Okay, so it's useful for that. You can examine a problem uh, or proposed change in terms of these different levels. The notion of logical levels is that it's a way to distinguish which part of somebody's experience they're currently paying attention to, which part of their experience they are currently paying attention to. And the model has six levels, environment, behavior, capability, beliefs and values, and mission, okay? Um, so the, the model, um, and, and then we have like a, uh, the, the, the division, uh, sorry, the identity. So after beliefs and values, we've got identity. And that's the, uh, the, 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 the who, and, and the mission, the vision, and some people call it the spiritual, um, the purpose, the vision. So environment, behavior, capabilities, beliefs, values, identity, uh, and, and we'll call it a vision uh, or mission. Then there's six levels. Um, some people divide the levels into two categories, and the two categories being um, what some people call the lower levels, environment, behavior, capability, and, and the higher levels, uh, beliefs, values, identity, and, and spirituality or, or purpose, as some people call it. So some people call this level here spirituality. Some people prefer to call it um, purpose, um, the vision, okay. Um, the logical levels can assist you in making changes at the higher levels or can help ensure our goals are aligned uh, or at all levels. So you've got alignment, okay, you've got alignment. Once this happens, your goals, the outcomes can become clearer, clearer vision of where you want to go and how you can get there and what you need to do to, to get there, what change you need. And you can decide what level you wish to intervene to bring about change. What level does one intervene to bring about change? So generally we work from the beginning, the beginning being the environment, and we work up. Environment, um, the environment is, is, is the when, and where the situation is occurring, the process is happening, 
behavior, uh, is the context. So the environment, sorry, is also the context in which something's happening. Um, the when, the where, with whom, uh, outside the entity, outside the person's self, the environment. The behavior uh, is the process, our actions, it's what we do. Okay? The behavior is uh, what we do, our actions. Okay? Um, a behavior, an action. Um, so 10 people in this room, for example, so you've got 10 people in the room uh, in the same environment and, and nine might not succeed to achieve the outcome and one does because of the action. Okay? Or, or nine succeed, one does, because of the actions. Or two people in one environment. Two people in one environment. One succeeds, one does not succeed in the eyes of society. In the same family, a group of siblings, one person goes on to be a career criminal, and one person goes on to be a successful entrepreneur. Uh, and does good for the world. In how are we class good as being good? One person becomes a successful sports person, one person becomes a uh, successful psychologist, one person becomes so in the same environment, but the actions we take has a big impact on, on, on what goes on, the behavior, what people are doing, uh, what activities taking place, um, what people see and experience in your behaviors. And, and we'll sort of go into more detail uh, of how we can utilize these in coaching, in change, in problem solving, in modeling excellence, when we cover modeling excellence too. Um, and a lot of dialogue, to be fair, is at behavioral level. A lot of dialogue you hear in conversations tend, tends to center around behavioral level, I would say, uh, at least in the work environment. That's why sometimes, you know, even going out for a, 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 a meal, uh, a work meal, and you see someone in a whole different light to what you saw them at work, and when they sort of start revealing their, their, their deep, <laughs> their values and beliefs and their identity. Okay, capability is how we do something. Um, our strategy, okay, how we do what we do. Uh, capability, you could say, internal. In NLP, we have a model that determines how we act. We covered that. You know, how we know what to do and when and when to do it. You know, how we know what to do. Um, a capability, it could be a skill or a strategy. Um, I guess the difference between a capability and a behavior is behavior is the end result of a capability. Okay, so you could say the behavior is the end result of a capability. Values and beliefs, um, well a value is in this context anyway, is what is important to you. How you evaluate what is right or wrong. Your rules are yours, my rules are mine. Uh, I guess that could be a series of rules, evaluation. Sometimes you do something, you feel bad about what you did. Sometimes you feel good about what you did. Okay, so you might see, you know, there might be a, um, you know, a wallet on the floor. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was at an airport and I found a, a wallet on the floor and had a wad of cash. And, I picked it up and I thought, hmm. <laughs> I thought, no, no, no. And, and I gave it back and it found its rightful line, I believe, at least I hope so. Uh, at least I was told I gave it back into the, the, the lost and the found. And, and, and equally, you know, uh, I, I found one of those um, I, I, iPhone type big things. And uh, uh, this, that's a book actually. That, but I found like a, an iPhone type thing, and those, those big tablets. And I, in the plane, I give it to the air person. And, and I actually sent the tweet out too at the time because I was a bit worried they might take it. So I thought we're stopping. So it's how we evaluate what's right or wrong. Now I'm not saying what I, what I do is right or wrong or wrong or right. We've all got our own way of evaluating uh, situations, which was going to more. Beliefs that we hold to be true. It's our reality. We talked about it before. Um, it's your own truth. And the belief can affect an outcome. Okay? What you hold to be true. Um, your, your sense of reality, the, the, the why, so to speak, the, the why. Um, beliefs and values, why we do certain things a certain way. They can enhance or limit our capabilities. People can have the capabilities to achieve something, an outcome or a task, 
you could cook if you wanted to, if you could be taught to cook. If you don't value it or believe in it, you probably won't do it. You could be taught ICT, if you don't value it, want to do it, then, then you probably won't succeed in the outcome. Okay? Um, you could be taught many things to, to drive a car, and if you don't value it, want to do it. And beliefs and values generally are outside the uh, conscious awareness. Okay, outside our conscious awareness, which we've touched on in the course. Identity, um, as long as your identity and beliefs uh, don't conform to behavioral change, regardless of your capabilities, you won't carry on doing it. Okay, so um, if you believe, behind the behavior is a belief. Okay, um, your behavioral change is not going to happen, regardless of how capable you are. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of things you're capable of doing, but you don't believe it's the right thing to do, or you don't believe you want to do it, then you won't do. You won't carry on doing it. Okay? So beliefs have an impact on our behavior, and our values have an impact on our behavior. We do. So if I decide to give that wall, I mean, to, it's part of my values, part of my beliefs. And, and we do many things based on our beliefs and our values, and I suppose you could argue many of the world's conflicts are based on beliefs and values. They can be very abstract. So you see, sometimes the war is on, on the one president says we're fighting in the name of freedom, um, and, which is a value one could consider is quite abstract. Um, and someone else believes one thing or the other, and we tend to de um, de defend our belief. The motivation comes from the values, the belief. You believe in something, you really want to do it. You will find a why. If you really want to do something, you'll find a, a, a you'll do it. If you don't want to do it, you'll find an excuse. Okay, if the belief doesn't change, if the belief does not change, then regardless of your capabilities, what you learn, what you're taught to do, your behavior, if the belief does not change, we talked about beliefs on the first day of the course, how powerful they are. Okay, how we see what we want to see how we see, how we have biases, perceptual biases, confirmation bias, our view of the world. So we've got 12 million information pieces, every coming in, streaming for our senses, see, hear, feel, touch receptor, uh, smell, taste, we delete, we distort, we generalize. It goes through a series of other filters which include uh, beliefs and values, and then we have an internal rep, and the result of that is a state, and that impacts our physiology and our behavior. Beliefs don't change, the very unlikely. Okay? So, identity, well, it can be expressed in a feeling, and we all know someone who's retired, and they feel sometimes a sense of loss or sometimes a sense of excitement, but they strip the label away. Um, we all, maybe a sports person becomes injured. They can't play sport no more. And they feel down because they lost their identity. The, the who. Okay? The sense of self. Sometimes we change identity. Our self and sense of self. Um, sometimes we change identity and all these are like do uh, the dominoes that we sort of see, they fall into alignment. Okay, if I consider myself as being the boss, or I consider myself as being the facilitator, it's going to have an impact on all these levels in an organization. Okay, if I consider myself and I label myself in one way, it's going to impact what I do throughout every level, so I can bring alignment here. Okay, more of that as we go along. Identity, as human beings, we are deeply driven by a sense of identity, who we are. I is a capital letter, denoting the importance we place on our sense of individual self. Okay, the first person someone looks at in a picture is themselves <laughs> in the group photo, our sense of self. Uh, Descartes, I think, therefore I am. Rene Descartes. So many social theories are based 
on creating identity or preserving our sense of identity. Okay? Um, we lose the job and we can take the rejection. The partner leaves the other person and the person loses the identity. They're one entity. They do everything together. They're almost like one person. They become one in one sense, but then one person goes away and the person's lost. It's funny yeah. you say that yeah. because that's what I'm experiencing at the moment. Mm. Like with the cooperative program that I work mm. around it, she's been, pro she's been promoted into the office. Yeah. And we used to have a team of three. So it's like with, with the cooperative group of guys, it's like one day to be teaching. Yeah, so yeah. I only get to see her on the one day. This with the cooperative supervisor is full mm. time. I've lost my identity because she's. Yeah, and, and people do. I mean, people retire from the. They could retire from the police force, they could retire from football, from sport, and every week when they play sport, the adulation of being the professional football, everyone screams for their name, they go down the street, they sign the autograph, everyone loves and adores them, and then all of a sudden they're not that person no more. And they walk through the street, and even the newspaper person just doesn't even recognize them anymore. It's like nobody knows me no more. They don't have the same adulation anymore. But equally, someone has a job as a, uh, uh, they could be a, um, a lawyer and they go home and cross-examine their family because they struggle to separate their identity. Their, 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 their identity is based on their profession. But we could talk more about that as we go along. Identity appears early in life. The infant. The infant begins to separate itself from the mum. The infant believes. It's one entity. Um, as an undifferentiated unit. An uh, image, a mirror image of themselves can provide a sudden shock, realizing they're separate beings. When I see an image of myself, sometimes I get a bit of a shock too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> What's going on? You've not a shame or a heck of 20 years, man. <laughs> so I feel for the poor infant. Goodness me. I'm like this when I go, man. I'm like, <laughs> but really, you. <laughs> but the infant gets a shock because it believes it's one. Okay, and young children typically cling on to things. You'll see the child, um, you know, cling on to a toy. This is not something I've like, seen from my book, by the way. It's all I could find. But the child sort of um, clings onto the toy like that. Okay, um, the teddy bear, the toy, the doll. I cling onto my book. <laughs> That's my identity, and, and, and they know they're identity. And sometimes you see some people, they keep the teddy bear. I'm not going to name names, but some people keep that teddy bear as a comfort for many years later. <laughs> yeah, some people, yeah. I mean, you can put it away now, that teddy bear, you know. Uh, and and the, the, the transition object, the, the psychoanalyst, um, who's that psychoanalyst that's going to come to him? You can Google him if you want to. I think it was Donald Winnicott. Donald Winnicott, um, he, he talks about uh, the removing the part of the identity causing distress and tears. So if you can Google the, the work of Donald Winnicott, he talks about the transition object, um, the psychoanalyst, uh, the identity is lost and causes distress and tears. So it's like, <laughs> what do I do? Okay. Um, so the pattern goes through our lives, we identify with possessions and things around us and feel bad when they're lost. Okay, so sometimes people, they lose everything. But they gain everything and sabotage it. We see people, they do lottery winning. And all of a sudden it changes, they, they buy all these things and, and they sort of sabotage it. Or sometimes people they find a nice relationship and they don't feel they deserve to be happy and they cut their relationship because they're too afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, or sometimes people, for example, the possessions around them, the, 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 the social status, um, the possession, they have identity, the car they drive, the house they live in, the area they live in, it becomes the sometimes a part of the identity, and when it's changed or lost, it can be the trauma. So identity, I guess the question is who? Um, you know, and think about it, you know, who, who, how would you find who you are? I'm gonna throw that to you to think about. I don't wanna mess with your head on the Sunday afternoon or morning, um, but who are you and what role do you play at home, at work, and so on and so forth. And, and, and finally the vision, how the person fits into the rest of the system. For whom or for what? So we all have a vision. Um, whether we're aware of it consciously or not, we have a vision. In life or work, a purpose on some level. Without a purpose, <clears throat> one can perish. Purpose is strong. Is your purpose 
uh, crystal clear. Okay, uh, clarify the purpose. And the purpose is a larger system. In work, will be family, co-workers, people needing your product, your service. Now, what is your purpose or impact you wish to have? Okay, so the purpose is in, in work is the impact you have, at least from a professional level, the impact you want to have, <clears throat> the greater good, so to speak, um, the role, the purpose of the role, the organisation, life in general. And think about your own organisation, what your purpose is, what your organisation's purpose is, what their vision is, um, what your purpose is within the organisation for the greater good, and life in general. Um, they're pretty fascinating insights into our mind. Is that still under identity? Oh, no, that was, a, that was separate. The, the, yeah. the, the, the purpose being the, the, the spirituality, the spirituality. Or, or, or the purposes that's own. Some people call it spirituality, some people call it person, our purpose, sorry. Um, it's a vision. Yeah. Equally, it's, it's the, the vision or the mission of the organisation. Um, so the six levels. Um, the understanding change, this model here, by the way, is really, really useful model for understanding change in a person, a team, a company. You can examine any problem or proposed change in terms of these different levels. It's, it's useful to cross-examine uh, the issue, which we'll do shortly. Generally speaking, there are higher levels. The higher levels have more leverage than lower levels. In order for you to, uh, to change permanently or as permanent as one can be to solve an issue, you generally would make a, a change at a higher level than where the problems exist, where the symptoms show up. And I'll sort of talk more about that as we go along. So, okay, um, I mentioned earlier you could, you could have all the capabilities in the world. If you don't value it, then you won't do it. Yeah. Okay, um, you, you, you could be trained to be a master in anything for that matter, but if you don't believe in the vision or the mission, or you don't believe in what you've been taught, you don't value it, it doesn't fit into your examination, you don't, it doesn't fit into your, your values, it's not important to you, then you won't do it, you won't do it well. Okay? Um, in, in, you know, the role, what's important is not the label for your role, it doesn't define your role, um, it's how you define your role is important. Because that's what has an impact on your results. How you define the role. I said the other day that we had a reunion one time from university and we had this conversation and, and what I found really, really fascinating was um, this uh, woman had said, oh, you guys are doing great. And we were all working in professional clubs and, and, and living our dream, so to speak, in that respect, or at least one area of our life. And, and she goes, oh, you guys are doing really, really great. I'm kind of in awe. And she goes, I've not been doing a great deal. So what have you been up to? She goes, I, I, I'm, I'm just a mum. I've just been bringing up two kids. And she, she's defined her role. So what's important is not the label, but how you define the role. So in, in my mind, being a parent myself, knowing how hard it is to be a parent, um, and, and so on and so forth, or being I'm a great parent, I'm a phenomenal parent, I'll leave my kids will tell you otherwise. <laughs> I believe so, I believe it. <laughs> they probably have a different opinion. Um, but being just a mum, but a mum's more than a mum, isn't it? A mum's a psychiatrist, a mum's a nutritionist, a mum's a taxi driver. You know, it's a hell of a job to bring up children. It really is. And, you know, you, I mean, at least that's my belief. You might find it easy, and if you do, send me some tips, by the way. <laughs> I'm always open to advice. But the point being is that she's undermining herself. I mean, all we were doing is working with football. And football, on the face of it, you just, it's a bag of wind. That's what it is, a bag of air. Football's just a piece of leather with air. You're knocking it about, that's, that's the end of that. You know, we give it something that means so much, really matters so little, little on the face of it, people get all worked up about But that's the truth, isn't it? At least that's my truth. But we can estimate ourselves. So you can ask different questions at different levels. The higher levels, the questions are more abstract. But I'll go for some questions you can ask. I won't let you off the hook, I'll, ask, I'll give you some questions, you can practice as well. I can do demos and we'll have fun with this, as you do. So different questions you would ask and I guess the higher up you go, the more abstract questions will be. So the environment level questions uh, are where based on where. The uh, behavioural question is the what. The capability question is the how. Beliefs and values is the why. The identity is the who. The vision question is the the who, the what, um, the greater good, purpose, uh, and that's as a general rule how the questions generally work. 
It's useful for modeling excellence. When we do modeling excellence on the course, uh, it's a really, really useful process to do. So if someone presents really, really well, if someone's a great coach, if someone's um, a good cook, if someone does something really, really well, it's useful to ask the questions um, on all these levels to get an insight into their uh, into their experience, into their mind. It's, it's a really powerful insight. You know, what do they, uh, where do they do what they do? Uh, what behaviors do they do? Um, how do they do it? Uh, why? Their beliefs about themselves, what they do, other people, their values, their identities. So it's quite a useful exercise in modeling people. And I've done it in organization for, for, for teams. When I worked in football, what I used to do was to go to teams and help turn them around. Um, at least one team I did that was in, in, in the lower leagues, I modeled all the big teams. And we didn't have the resources that they, big teams had, but I would model them and try and find the resources. So, for example, um, I would model some of the biggest teams in the world and then, then try and find the fit to what they would do. We didn't have their resources, but I could team up with, and, and it was on the papers, me teaming up with, say, um, different universities to provide us fitness testing, to provide us psychology to provide all the things they were getting at the biggest club but on a shoestring because there were students who want to okay you could argue we may have not got the same level of professional but we might have got better who knows but the point being the resources I had was available to me so I could go to a Bolton Union and say look guys um, can you do some fitness testing I could go to another university South or do you do fitness testing we do send some students to do game analysis so they had a league club like Barry League Two who's at the time on the brink of obscurity financially you want to produce players and, and keep it, it makes sense to sort of go to learn the bigger teams but you can't always go like for like we don't have a budget of say a United but we do have and can do is, is take what we can and we produce players we do really really well uh, to that extent but that's another story another day and I do it in business too and I do it with individuals I'll use that um, as, as a blueprint um, obviously not the only thing I do when I'm modeling people uh, but it is part of the, uh, what I do. So then, let's, um, let's have a, 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 you know, a bit of, I'll create a scenario. So okay, let's, let's sort of solidify the learning, if one can solidify learning. Okay, so understanding in, in business, okay. Let's sort of focus. Assume it's 10 a.m. on a Monday morning. <laughs> okay, having a nice Sunday, so I don't want to sort of stun the system. But assume tomorrow morning, uh, 10 a.m., yeah, all of your colleagues, and you've got a meeting scheduled in your office. The office being the environment, or in the office, okay? 10 o'clock in the morning, Monday morning, you've your work colleagues, and you're told you've got a meeting in the office, okay? You've been given a new role, as much as you know, and it's the motion, because you have been stripped of certain responsibilities, okay? What are the responses? Okay, 10 o'clock, you hold into the office and you tell, new role, strip the responsibilities. Some people might say, yay, take even more if you want. Um, but the point being, you, you go up to the boss and say, why? Um, you could tell one of your work colleagues, um, he's got it all wrong, or she's got it all wrong. You could start with shouting and acting silly, with the hope you might grab the boss's attention and be called in the office. So the behavior you select depends on your capabilities and strategies. If you're confident of these, approaching the boss and asking him or her uh, what was behind the decision you made. Okay? The capability, you know, why? Let's, let's chat about it. So rather than run up and down the corridor and doing handstands and, and telling everybody else, scumbag, the motor me, and, okay, the behavior you select depends on your capabilities and strategies. Okay? He might not have the capability, she might not have the capability to do that. Okay? If you're not confident, um, you could tell one of your colleagues how the boss has got it all wrong. You might start screaming and acting silly to grab the boss's attention. Who calls in the office and might say, well, leave the company now. <laughs> Type thing that's ground dismissal, so to speak. So the behavior you select. Okay? The capability and strategy you choose will depend on your values and beliefs. Okay? The capability and strategy you use. Uh, if you believe you're an important part of the company, a good performer, and have a lot to offer the company, when you've got the opportunity to adapt to your role, then you're more likely to go up to the boss and ask him or her about it. Okay? 
If you believe you are, you are an important part of the company, a good performer, and have a lot of the company, when you get an opportunity, to, uh, you know, you go up and you say, okay, um, you know, let's let's talk about that. You know, you know you're important to the company. You know you're you're valued. Um, the decision to change your role, what is it? Okay, if you felt you were left out because your ability or your boss's inability to understand the company strategy and you think that the boss inadequate uh, without asking him or her this, uh, you may tell your colleagues what a ridiculous decision it was and look for an exit strategy. We've all been there before, we've all seen jokes like that. Okay, what a silly decision. Okay, and in sport, sometimes if I heard that the manager was going to sell a certain player and I believed the player was worth their weight in gold, yeah, I would think a number of things, but the logical thing to do would be, okay, uh, he values my uh, experience and my expertise, I'll knock on door. He'll tell me where to go, you don't know nothing about the game, stick to your job, but I still don't believe enough to knock on door. But the point being, you see how one thing impacts the other, your identity is dependent on your purpose in the company, the contribution or positive impact you wish to have on your company, and how you define who you are, the sense of self. Okay, um, so it sort of gives you a bit of an insight, you know, it's, you know, how one thing can impact the other, and we'll start to do an exercise shortly um, to solidify uh, the learning, so to speak. Um, it's really useful for coaching. Um, so let's have a look at coaching, okay? Um, before we break for lunch, do a demo, do some practical stuff, let's look at, say, one-to-one -one coaching. So one-to-one -one coaching, you got the outcome. So you might want to join in the exercise. So think of an outcome that you want. You might want to do effective presentations. You might want to do um, improve your leadership. You might want to, the outcome might be, um, you might want to uh, it, give yourself the best chance of achieving a job at an interview, for example. So, an outcome. And then we relate to the outcome, uh, the questions are related to the outcome that the client wants to achieve. So if you're coaching somebody, the questions are related to the outcome the client wants to achieve. So we can start the environment at this level. So for the outcome you want, for the outcome you're wanting, uh, that you want, uh, what is important, uh, where you do, and when you do it. So we can consider what things outside yourself will be important to take into consideration. Okay, like where's the interview? Uh, where's the presentation? Um, external, outside the self, for the outcome you want. Okay, what is important about where you do and when you do it? So where you do the process and when you do the process. Okay? The behavior, what action will you use to achieve the outcome? What action? Okay? and hold that thought, and we can go over what you put down afterwards, and we can look at red flags. Um, okay, so what action will you use to achieve the outcome, or different actions? Uh, you might not know. If you don't know, find someone who does know. If they don't know, ask around. And if you find someone who does know, and doesn't want to tell you, then find somebody else. Okay, um, so what action will you use to achieve the outcome? Uh, the skills and capabilities, what skills and capabilities are necessary to achieve the outcome? Do you have them? How well you develop the skills and capabilities? Okay, what skills and capabilities do you have at present to achieve the outcome? What is the best way for you to use the skills and capabilities you already have? Okay, I do speaking. There's no secret, I do speaking, I'm part of a speaking group called Toastmasters. No, I'm not commissioned for advertising because I pay my subscription like anybody else and I make nothing, albeit I entice members, and, and I refine my skills by going there. 
I had the competition uh, as well to test myself, to challenge myself, because I've got that competitive streak, as you do. So I've got a series of skills that I've learned over many, many years, and I develop them, but I'm always learning, because some great speakers there, phenomenal speakers, awesome speakers. Come down and check us out, and you'll see some great speakers. So I always add to my skill set. I'm not the finished article, no one ever is. Okay? Um, but equally, if I'm coaching someone to be the best they can be, we can sort of decide, okay, what skills and capabilities do you have? What are you using that you have, and what aren't you using? And what is the best way to use the skills you already got? Okay, and that gives an idea what, 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 what training, what, what we need to do, okay, um, to get there. Sport, coaching, and, and uh, many, many things you could be coaching someone in, and business, and so on and so forth. Um, the beliefs and values, okay, what's important about the outcome? What's important to you? What motivates you? Okay. What motivates you? Okay. What motivates me to write these? And while you're at it, you can get this on Amazon. <laughs> what motivates me is to make a difference. The why. I'm very passionate about what I do. I love working with people. I really enjoy working with people. I think people are wonderful. There's a lot of good in people. There's a lot of great people out there. Uh, albeit the world's not a perfect place and there's many, many problems in the world. But equally, one of my values is leaving a legacy. I want to plant trees for people to sit under the tree in, in many years. I, one of my values is legacy, so what motivates me, my beliefs, and I believe I can make a change. I believe I'm not for everybody, I believe I'm for a lot of people that I can help. When I do talk in the school or the college, just, I, I do it because I'm motivated because of my situation as a young person. It wasn't ideal, and I turned it around. And I believe I can turn it around, then anybody can turn around. So let's give you an insight to my uh, head, but you think, what beliefs do you have about the outcome? And we talked about that earlier. You know, what beliefs do you have about the outcome? What beliefs do you have about cooking well for the family? What beliefs do you have about um, being a, a manager? In, in, what beliefs do you have about being a presenter? About yourself, about others, the world? Okay, what are the hurdles, the barriers? Okay, what are the barriers? Um, and how can you overcome the barriers? And if you don't know how, ask someone who has. And if they don't know how, but I want to tell you how, keep asking. Because if you keep knocking on the door, guess what happens? Someone will open that door for you. Okay? And it takes one door to open. So belief, I'm sharing some of my beliefs. Okay, what values and beliefs do you hold? If you lead by example, you will probably have strong values relating to taking responsibility. Okay, what values do you hold? So to give you an idea, if someone leads by example, they're probably going to have strong values around responsibility and ensuring you get the best of your colleagues and associates uh, uh, around you. So that sort of gives you an insight to people's, um, what values they have. These values will be supported by a number of beliefs. Values are supported by belief. The nature of beliefs cause you to focus on your values to prove the beliefs are true. So whatever you believe to be true, you will seek evidence to prove it. So if I think I'm the special one, then I'll seek evidence to prove that. And I'm not saying go call yourself a special one. And by the way, I was staying in a hotel nearby to, to make life easier for myself this morning to do the training. And I got up this morning, and you know when you go to have breakfast, and, and, and uh, she said, rune number, sir. And I said, oh, I, I couldn't remember my rune number. Said, Goodness me, I went all blank. I had one of the moments. And she goes, what's your name? I, I can remember that. I go, my name's a special one. <laughs> and she goes, special one? I, I can't find that, sir. I said, well, surely this must be on there. Special one. It's me being silly sometimes. I have those moments. <laughs> Amongst polite company that you guys are shared. I said, I sure you can't find it. Is he joking? No, I'm joking. I said, my name is a special one. Uh, she said, special me is more like you. <laughs> I said, you're probably right. You're probably right. I've been told before. I've been told before. Um, but equally, in the end, to be fair, um, we got there in the end. <laughs> I told the truth. I said, I apologize. It's too early in the morning on Sunday to do that to you. 
<laughs> I'm a clown. <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's what I believe. That's true. So whatever you believe is true, you're going to see government's approval and ignore that it's the contrary. I talked about yesterday the, the woman who believed that she was ugly in the eyes of the corporation, and, and she seeks evidence to prove that. Even though 100 people say you look really, really wonderful, I don't like the colour of your shoes, she'd ruminate over it. So you're going to seek evidence to prove that. And just look at social media, the people that sort of, they, they're, sort of, they're in clusters and that sort of stuff. If you like my page, I like your page. <laughs> if you believe what I want, it's okay, it's okay to have an opinion as long as it's my opinion. <laughs> it's not my opinion, they're good. So generally people will sort of like that button straight away within one second. They don't like one second, they don't like it at all, and they look for things that they can buy into. Okay? Um, so if you want loads of likes, and, and you've come to that course for that, be part of the herd. Be part of that. They'll love you for it. You know? Put pieces of Starbucks on there and corporation. You know, be part of the collective, and they're going to love you for that. Okay? Don't be controversial. <laughs> And you get the thumbs down. There's going to be a new button, by the way. They're making it for me. It's that. <laughs> <laughs> that means peace. <laughs> okay. I really liked what you are saying there. Yeah. Though, because I remember mm. the girl that I've um, been helping a little bit um, showed me a YouTube video of... Um, I guess um, I mean. It's like a TED Talk. <laughs> yeah. Ruby Wax had done. And Ruby Wax is quite into a sort of mental health. Oh, yeah, yeah, very much so, yeah. And I remember sort of hearing part of it and I kind of felt straight away that what Ruby was saying was pretty much validating what she believed about herself. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. But, you know, I mean, there, there is a saying that, okay, um, if, you, if you match someone's meta, uh, meta model violations, um, then, then you, you're going to get instant rapport. But that's another story for another day, that's for sure. So, so you, you, you sort of <laughs> match them up with the world. Because people like people who are the same as them, who they aspire to be. But, that's another story for another day. But, you know, your beliefs have an impact on your capability. Um, you know, quite simply, believe you can do something, you find a way of doing it. If you don't believe, I'm not cut out for this, then you'll find a way of, of, of you know. And, and we talk about projection, you know. It's important. The living belief, um, it's, it, you know, you put a kaleidoscope on, on a pattern, and although you've got the power to change it, you're afraid to do it because you're unaware of the, you know, from the conscious consequence. So, for me, when I was driving one time to do a talk sport interview on the radio, for my book, by the way, um, and it wasn't my book, and I was listening to the radio, and it was, it was interesting really because there's a, a footballer on the radio before me talking, being interviewed, and he, he played for Mourinho, and they said to me, go, what is it about Mourinho? Uh, and he sort of, he, he goes, he clearly put his um, thumb on it, finger on it, and he goes, his belief in, in us as players. And it's quite interesting when he said that because I thought, it's projection. So if I believe in you guys, it's projection. It, it projects on itself. We talked about that sort of, uh, theory on the first day where we project our own beliefs mm -hmm. and that's powerful so if you're going in there like this you know uh, you know I, I, I don't think they'll do well or these students will never learn or those players are no good you're going to project that you're going to project that and, and for me when I used to work in care home and education when I first said we're going to do GCSE I said Jim you're off your head as that what are you playing and I said no we're going to do it I believe they can do it and okay, some didn't get A's or B's, but they got grades. And no sooner than I did, they used to believe they can do it too. And they started doing it too. So I don't care what anyone says, I broke that mold. Mm -hmm. I gave it a shot. I put my neck on the chopping block. Mm -hmm. I believe. But I believe because I knew at that age I wasn't Greg Speller either. Mm -hmm. But I won't harp on about my book, but I still write for every best on books. <laughs> but the point being is that, you know, you'll, you'll find excuses. People find excuses all the time because they believe. Um, the other end of the spectrum, people find excuses to get things done. You know, well, how else would it have turned out? So your belief is powerful, powerful. You know, um, you'll generate possibilities. Is the energy, uh, the identity? Who will you become when you achieve the outcome? Now, from the coaching, who will you become when you achieve the outcome? Your identity. Okay, and how does that fit into the greater good? Now, what purpose do you have for achieving the vision? the outcome, now, your vision, okay? And, and, you know, you've got the power within you to make a big difference. One becomes two, three, five. I believe that if I can go into one town and change one person's mindset, it has a big knock-on effect. Because one becomes two, three, they have children, they then have children. And I'm not saying my way is the right way or my way is the wrong way. I'm just saying personally that you can, identity's big, you know, it's huge, the mission, okay? Uh, what purpose do you have for achieving the outcome? 
the greater good. Because sometimes you need that purpose. When I get up in the morning, sometimes those old sports injuries sort of start playing up on me, and the knees and, 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 and the back and that sort of stuff. Now I think about my purpose. A long day ahead of me, I think the purpose of traveling and doing talks, engagements, the purpose of the outcome. And when you go through that process, by the way, um, from, from you know, bottom to top, the questions I asked you, give the person time to process it. Time to process it. Uh, and then you can go the other way. So you can go all the way up, some time to process it, um, and then you can go all the way the other way. Similar to the same question if you're coaching from that point of view. And you go all the way up again and all the way down as often as you want. Doesn't matter, there's no rule. But generally speaking, go up, go down. Okay, powerful stuff. Really, really powerful stuff. Really useful stuff. And you can the do this. The idea of that, that, that you kind of, you sort of start at the bottom and environment, you go up, the more and more things are kind of coming up to them. So as you. Yeah. No, no, great question. Um, so the question is, 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 is by going down the other way, Again, it'd be quite useful because you get uh, a different perspective on the on, on the situation. So, okay, that's one perspective and one way of doing it. And I suppose you could argue that these levels probably aren't as leverage as the other levels. If this broke away, these levels are probably going to hold more. Because, like I said earlier, you could, you could have all the capitalism in the world, behaviour could be in place, you have the right environment, that believe or value, or you won't do it. So it might be a useful exercise to introspectively to sort of go up that way, go through levels that probably hold the less leverage on change and then go back the other way again. Mm -hmm. And that can be quite useful, I think, anyway, to see it from a different perspective and, 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 and constantly again, and, you know, for, for a number of reasons we can, we can do that. But we can also do this, I mentioned earlier, and I'm mindful of break and we'll sort of carry on this theme, is to evaluate your coaching effectiveness. And you can ask evaluation questions too. So if you're coaching somebody, it's a good evaluation tool to use. And you can say, okay, what changed improvements as a result of your coaching? Because if you're going to be coaching people in business, they want to know. The bottom line in business is they, they want to increase their profit, one would think, to a certain point. But also, to, I mentioned uh, about the H, the human performance indicator I talked about, rather than the KPI. The KPI being an external fact, external attribution. The HPI, improve enthusiasm, motivation, the human performance indicator, which is more difficult to measure because you have a member of staff and you raise their mental game, they're confident, they're motor, they're enthusiastic, internal attribution, what they can control. But here's an opportunity then to sort of evaluate your coaching. And the evaluation would be what changes, improvements, results has my coaching had on the external environment? What improvements, results, and impact has the coaching had on the behavior? What changed improvements, results, impact has the coaching had on the capability? And so on and so forth. And that'd be quite useful to do an evaluation. Okay? That'd be quite useful to do an evaluation because you start at the beginning and then you see how far you've come. You can evaluate uh, what's happened. Okay? depending on the environment that you're in. And you can do that with individuals, teams, and organization. Okay? Um, it's a useful model for understanding change in a person, a team or company. You can examine a problem or propose change also in terms of these levels too. Um, that can be done as well. The first step to taking control is to identify what level the emotions are sending warning signals. So you'll know how you feel when you go through the process at various levels too. And you'll get that sort of, the emotion we talked about yesterday being the, uh, the, the, the flashlight, the survival. Okay, you'll know. You, you get a feeling. Because generally speaking, the deeper levels have more leverage than lower levels. So to only solve a problem, you have to make changes at least one level higher than the ones where the symptoms are showing up. I mean, you could go in here the problem is capability, they don't have the capability, you go here and, and, and change that, but you still want to be working out here as well. Belief, they value it. Okay, so the issue here, we go here, at least here, and above, and beyond. Okay, 
That's a useful model for understanding change in a team or company, and you can examine any problem on a proposed change in terms of these different levels too. Uh, you know what needs to, so from a change point of view, before we break for lunch, uh, from a change point of view, what needs to change in the environment external to you, in your team, or the organization? So we're going to look at you, team, organization, because of time. Okay, so what change to achieve the outcome, the vision, the change? Okay, behavior. What do you or your team, organization, need to do differently? What do you need to do differently? Capability. What skills and capabilities do you or the team have or the organization need to bring about the change? Okay. Why should you or the team or the organization make the changes for, for, for what purpose? And we see organizations now recruit on values, not just capabilities, because they realize the organization knows that you can teach pretty much anyone anything. If they don't value it, they won't get very far. They don't believe in that. They don't believe in, in, in the vision, the mission. So they do recruit identity. Who will you, who will you or the team organize and become when you change? How? We've never gone the vision now. Um, how will the change contribute to everything else beyond your team and organization? What you do, think of the, there's a, there's a little pond outside. You throw a pebble in the pond and it sends a ripple. What you do can send the ripple. Waves. Waves everywhere. Okay? And sometimes people talk, and it's quite interesting when they talk, and you know, I'm mindful of, 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 of lunch now, and, and what I find quite, uh, quite fascinating um, when, when people communicate um, we can tune into the, the way they communicate. And we talked about certain questions one could ask in certain situations. So if I say, I can't do that here, what do you think it might be insinuating? On what level do you think the issue might exist? Can't do that here. What level do you think? Yeah. I can't do that here. And so on and so forth. So sometimes the clues are in the language. Mm -hmm. Use some clues. I'm not cut out for this. I'm the special one. <laughs> we don't do this here. Okay? So language is quite useful from that point of view. But if you want to know more about that, you've got to buy this. <laughs> no, you've you got to come back after lunch. Okay, you know? Have you emailed to which one? I, I, I can't email that, I'll get in big trouble with the publishing company, or, or, or probably <laughs> they won't value me no more. Um, I do email you a book, and the book that I email you is the one that I've got all the rights to. It's a different one. But I can't email books that I have rights to. Uh, this one is the, uh, this one is the excellent business, available in all leading retailers. <laughs> it's available. <laughs> As you do. But if you buy from me, I'll give you a discount today. Right. And if you buy it now, I'll give you a buy one, get one free. <laughs> um, but there we go. No, it's been, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of lunch. I don't want to eat too lunch. We're going to, you know, carry on after lunch for sure. It's, 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 it is a great and it's fascinating. So um, we, we shall break now. Uh, rest well for lunch. The sun is shining. It's a beautiful day. And um, we'll come back and, and, and go from there.